You got another hunk of junk on the bench. Yep. Well, this, this is going to be this is going to be the last example in the high watt quest. I think that we're probably going to be the last that we talk about because I feel like we we sort of um, arrived at a at a point where we know what this range of really great sounding high watts is. Well, we were sort of talking about, okay, the real sweet spot is in the mid 70s. And then we figured out, okay, here's how you make a late 70s version into the sweet spot sort of amplifier. But now on the bench is kind of the earliest out, not outlier, but um, what, what year is this? This is a, this is a, um, a 1970, okay. 37th week of, let's see, uh, yeah, 30, 35, 35th to 37th week of 1970. So that's the third quarter of 1970. So from July to the end of the year. Yeah of 1970 so folding into 71 just about so how different is this circuit from say a 74 or 75 uh as stock there are two component differences really yeah that's it yeah huh. and uh this one has been kind of messed with okay and we're going to basically unmess it up it's very minor somebody monkeyed around with the bias somebody else had had modified at one point and did a sloppy job of putting it back to stock and I'm not going to concern myself too much about cleaning that part up right now. Okay. We're just going to put the correct components in the bias circuit and um yeah, and let's, then we we'll, let's point out what you're going to do. Uh so this resistor is not stock. Okay. It's supposed to be I believe a 47k, so we're going to take that out and we're going to neatly install the correct one. Okay. And um, this capacitor has got a mushroom growing out of it. Yeah. So uh, it is presumed bad. We're going to do the thing that we never do, which is look at it and go, yeah, it needs to be replaced. <laughs> okay, does it really need to be replaced? We're going to replace it. Why? Because it's not mine. And if it was mine, I would do this, check it, and see if it actually needs to be replaced. Well... Here's the 30 mic section, uh -huh. reading 34 mics, and my test frequency is 120 hertz, okay. which is the standard test frequency I use on all the filter caps because they're operating in the power supply and their job is to filter out everything below 100 hertz. So this is right, saying right where it's supposed to be at that 120 hertz level. Um, now this one is the 15 mic, the 16 mic section, which is farther down towards the front of the preamp uh, stage, the very first stage decoupling capacitor. It is reading uh, 15 mics, give or take a half, uh, a, half a mic. Mm -hmm. And that puts it well within tolerance also. So technically there's nothing wrong with this capacitor. But it's looking... But it's looking funky. A little funky. And since it's not mine, since the owner is going to want to be using it and playing it and having it in top performance, we're going to replace that. If it sure. was mine, I would probably leave it in there just just so people could go, ah, when they're watching the video. <laughs> that's how we roll. <laughs> um, it's a malcontent life around yeah, here. Yeah, everything else is pretty much okay. Okay, so that's that's what's going to be done. Um, right. So what, is there a particular, um, like you're going to replace that cap. Uh -huh. um, what are you replacing it with? Something special? Something very special. An ARS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uh, what's the story here, Fryad? Okay, this is an ARS dual section can. 32 on on one pin and 16 mics on the other pin just like this okay this is an, an a copy of the original type of capacitor it was in there same diameter 
We're not going to put black tape around this because we don't need to. This but is already insulated you've well You've been enough. a little down on the ARS stuff at times. See, here's the thing. ARS is still playing this I can't find the documentation, <laughs> call me later okay. story, which means I don't want you to know who made the capacitor. <laughs> And that's kind of always been my beef about those guys. Just give me the stupid document, all right? I mean, you, it's not like a state secret. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the the Kremlin isn't going to come down on you and throw you out a window because you told me who made your stupid <laughs> capacitor. But that's the, the mentality that some people operate at. Uh, outside of that, there's not much. Technically, there shouldn't be anything different than this or the JJ1 or the F&T or wh whoever makes you know an aftermarket copy of this mm -hmm. the only thing that matters is is it to spec all right so, oh so back to the capacitor we, we checker. got gizmos to we test. got good gizmos that tell us that so um on this one the yellow section was 32 mic and the red section is 16 yeah so on this one the pin marked with the yellow paint is reading 15 mics and the one with the red paint is reading 30 mics so this is dead on the values it's supposed to be at but let's just go double check this again here's the middle one that's ground the one with the red paint is reading this is going to be 30. These leads are really sensitive. They've got to make a good contact or we won't get an accurate reading yet. So this is the red one on here oh, the red one. Is, the, is the 15 mic side. The red one on here is the 30 mic side. So you don't just put this in here and copy how the leads are laid yeah, out. You're going to have problems. You're going to, it's not going to be right. So yeah. you have to, we're going to basically be reversing these two wires. Right. They're these, actually these two wires. The center one is ground. Uh, we're going to install that so that it's like that. And the red one is going to go to the bottom. And the blue one is going to go to the top. We have plenty of lead for that. So that's going to go in there to replace that. However, we don't actually have to do that to play test it. Uh, so we could do that, but we have the wrong bias anyway. So probably the best thing to do is we'll go ahead and... Put the bias back to stock and replace this cap and then we'll fire it up check it and then we'll play test it and we'll compare that to the friedman pa head i did where we returned it to where we rewired it to a dr 103 mid 70s version and we'll listen to both of them and we'll find out how much difference this one sounds to the friedman one like we did with joe joe barisi's amp which was a later model that we modded back. That was a 78, right? That was a 78. And we're gonna, what what the customer wants to do, he watched this video. Uh -huh. He watched the videos we've been doing. Wait, this customer? Yeah. Oh. So he says, hey, I got a guinea pig, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm saying this is gonna be about the last one because this represents the other end of the spectrum. We're bringing this up. To right, the we're bringing this up. Yeah. And then after that, I'm just saying this now, to, publicly after that we're going to just stop this series because we're just getting we're getting flooded with guys that have these that want to send them here and have us do that thing we're not doing this because we're getting in the high old high watt mod business we're doing this to illustrate a, a point about the behavior of high watts the different ones and the range why i like the ones that are in the range that i like them at yeah and once that's accomplished we got work to do and we're going to go back to that work all right now all right. are you ready to do work on this one yeah all right so uh way we go
Nine minutes, 14 seconds. <laughs> Pow. <laughs> now what do we do? Um, we're gonna do a quick test. Okay. Is this a play test or is this a scopey test? We're gonna do a scope test. Okay. Which means I'm gonna change it to eight ohms because that's the, the load that I have on the test bench. Okay. Set up. Well, um, I'm going to take a break from our uh, regularly scheduled program just to show what Masa is working on over there. All right. Look what we have here. Look at Whoa. these. Whoa. My favorite amp of all time. Yeah, You're doing two of them. Okay. Ether time. Over. Back to high <laughs> watt time. <laughs> just a quick diversion. Just a little diversion. Okay. That's the right place. Ah. See, even I have to pay attention once in a while. Oh, don't do that. Yeah, seriously. Okay, so... Paying attention just... isn't very rock and roll, yeah, Steve. Yeah, it's not at all rock and roll. So, we're going to do this. <laughs> right, exactly. line voltage grids we've got minus 40 volts which is which is factory that's where it's supposed to be between 38 and 40 okay depending on the line voltage our line voltage is right up there so i'm going to drop it back a little bit to uh closer to 117 as opposed to 120 and that there we should get about 38 there we are 39 and we should be ready to fly Master volume. I'm going to feed the signal into the master volume here like I always do. Yep. And I need to do a quick little setup. That's good. And sync to channel one on this scope. That's good. And we should be ready to rock. Dude, so rocking. We are rocking. Okay. You hear that rock? There's Do you see that rock? Coming up. And it's going to go right to, it's actually going to go full screen at this point. Okay. A little past full screen, actually, yep. which is which is the high watt way of saying, that's right, Jack. Uh, this this like amp no has actually got. Distortion. Mm, well, we're not, we haven't hit clipping yet because we can't see clipping. So let's oh, just do this. <clears throat> and there's clipping right there. Got it. And uh, I've already checked all the power supply filter capacitors in this, and they're all validated. So Great. this is a normal amount of ripple at that amount of current. And then we'll just go down and look at the bottom side and see it's the same. But we're off screen, but that's a clip, the point of clipping right there. Uh -huh. And at that point, we're 29.77 volts, which is basically 20, 30 volts. And 30 volts at 8 ohms is going to be about 110, 30 times 30, about 8, 112 and a half watts. Okay. And then also, uh, let's see, that's the master. Okay, while we're here, I'm just gonna look at the square wave response. And this is really interesting. Just, we're taping this, so you can go back and look at this when we do, either after the mod or when we do, when we look at Dave's amp. But this is a, a really uh, aggressive, High frequency. I was going to say that's, forwardness. Is, is the presence uh, jacked up? This is right the now. presence jacked up, but this is the presence at twelve o'clock, and it's Whoa, still really? way up there. We have to turn the presence down that's to spiky, spiky about ten o'clock position before we start attenuating the presence enough that you don't hear it. So I've never seen that before. Even the it, other ones that we looked at. This, this yeah, this the, this version of. High watt, that's a characteristic of it. Now we're going to go back and we'll play test it right now and just make sure it's all good.
Okay. And we're just going to have this is going to be our uh, our uh, our uh, our initial audition, sonic audition of the amp. Great. Um, and we'll decide what we think of the sound of it from there. All right, coming right up. All right. All right. What are we doing? Okay, we're powering it up again. Only this time it's plugged in directly to the cab. Okay. Through the power station. Just to uh, hear what's going on. It we have sense. sound. We have sound. We have ground. I'm just checking to see how dirty the pots are. That one got a fair amount of oxidation. I'm gonna have to spray that one, but we're we're waiting for a couple of cans of R5 to come through. That's a more than normal amount of hum. That might be coming from this because okay. the jumper cable usually will pick up noise external to the chassis. Yeah. So let's see if that takes care of that. Yeah, mm. that's where it's coming from. And that's pretty normal. So uh, we'll clean the pot later when the when the pot cleaner stuff arrives. But I just wanted to hear that first. Now we can plug it in. Okay. Guitar and, time. And uh, I'll just check each of the inputs separately. It's, this sounds really good. Uh, it's a little on the tubby side compared to uh, a, a, the later version. It's actually better sounding than I expected. say it sounds a hell of a lot warmer than I expected. Mm. Uh, you're actually right about that. I agree with you. Nice. Actually, it sounds a little wider like Joe's. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But it's the same output transformer as Dave's. On the other hand, it's got uh, it's got RCA labeled 6CA7s in it. Okay. Uh, now let's look at those for a sec. Two of them are big bottle 6CA7s and two of them are skinny bottle ones labeled 6CA7s. The outside two are American made 6CA7s labeled RCA. The inside two are made about the same era and these are uh, RFT. In other words, East German produced EL 34s labeled 6 ca 7s So that's, that's, that's an example of what I've said a long time about once the two manufacturers are starting to either fade out of production or they're short of the materials that they need to ship to customers, they buy them from other sources and rebrand them. So this has been going on as long as tubes have been manufactured. It's nothing like... It's not like a modern phenomenon. Oh, so, it's like any industry. Right. So that's that's going to help give it that little bit more robust bottom end and more clarity like we heard in Joe's, which has has uh, a Muller DL34. Right. It? right. Um, 
Now, let's put it through the power station and see what it sounds like after we put the screws to it a little bit. Here it has that sort of ratty way thing on the bottom. We can yep. get rid of some of that by turning down the normal volume. What if we pull back on the bass control? Um, it's pretty down already. Way down and the normal volume way down. It's got that tubby character. It's got that tubby character. And the the owner of this commented that he didn't care for that quality of it. And when I saw which version it was, I thought, well, two things are going to whip this into shape. One of them is possibly doing that mod variation, which is involves two resistors. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the other one is going to be retubing it. So um, the first thing I want to do before we change it is I want to do a frequency. See, this is something that we haven't done before. And the reason I want to do it now is because we're set up to do it, number one. And number two, when we were talking about Go Reese Amp, we, didn't, we weren't set up to do a frequency sweep, so we couldn't compare a frequency analyzer graph. Yeah, we're just playing amps in a room. Right. So um, we're going to set up to do that. All right. So and we'll do that. Gonna, we're actually going to be able to see where that, how much effect the diff, that little minor modification, that little minor circuit difference right. between this one and the later one has on the overall frequency response. We're going to be able to compare that. Perfect. All right. We'll set that up now. All right, so we're going to do a tube check here. Right, so have? just just to, just to check out what we have in here, we've got um, uh, Amperex ECC 83s labeled West Germany. Okay. So we've got the uh, ECC 83 there, which is correct. The this says e, it says ECC 3 E83 over there, and 12AX7A over there. So there was a an original. There was an original white printing, and then it got yeah, printed look at over. That. Wow! So um, <laughs> that could be an indication of where it was made. So this is this should be an ECC eighty one. It is. Uh, no, it's a twelve AU seven. Yeah, but it says ECC eighty one in there as well. It, it says it know. says ECC eighty one and twelve A. Oh, it's a T. I was reading it wrong. Oh, I thought, okay. AT7? Yeah, so okay. that's correct for that position. And then this one should be a 12AX ECC 3 It is. Does it have that white print over? It business? does. Look at that. See? <laughs> so some new old stock tube geek out there will look at that and go, oh, I know what that is. Yeah. And uh, so if you're one of those guys, feel free to chime in. Okay, so we have a new character okay, in this yeah, episode. We have, Who do we, we got are, here? We have Julian here. He's Julian! A, he's a, yeah. a new addition to the team, and uh, uh, right now he's serving as a technical assistant. And uh, we brought him into the video to hook up uh, an audio analyzer, because we're starting to use this more and more in our product development. And we thought that it would be fun to analyze, rather than just go by intuition and and just using our ears just using stupid our ears. idea we're that actually going to see what we're talking about on on screen on okay. an audio analyzer so so what are we doing here we've I got have, some more gear <laughs> i have the uh i have the the same high watt amp right running through a uh a resistive load not a reactive load because we don't want the load to influence the the frequency response of the amp. Okay, that makes like sense. Like you normally would want to do, because we're just testing the bandwidth of the amp itself. Right. We're testing the bandwidth of the amp at two points. Okay. Right at the master volume, where it feeds into the next stage that ultimately feeds the power amp. Uh huh. That stage has a little bit of frequency uh, compensation in it, both 
versions of the high watt do, but they're slightly different. Okay. The second position is going to be past that frequency compensation where we're going directly into the phase inverter, where it since the transformer is the same and the phase inverter is the same, the what the screen shows us should be more or less the same. The only variables there would be just the behavior of the tubes that are being used, but they're biased the same, mm -hmm. all of that. Okay. So what we were talking about the presence control earlier, you can see uh, the famous, what we're looking at a frequency range of 20 hertz to 50 kilohertz. Okay. Now, only on a high watt will you see the frequency, a high frequency response extend out to the 50 kilohertz range and not start rolling off right after 10 or okay. at least 20. It's way out there. That's typical of the design of the high watt output transformer. But what we were also saying is the presence control is really super active. And right now I have it set at nine o'clock and now I'm gonna turn it down to zero. And yep. you can see that the high frequency rolls off uh, at about 20 kilohertz. And this is, this is if the amp is too bright, you just turn this all the way down and it's starting to sound normal. And as you can see, it's starting to behave normally. Yeah. However, the bottom end is still uh, what it is. The tone controls, none of the gain controls were, were past all of that. So going back to the nine o'clock position, there we can flatten it out. Now this is what we were looking at earlier, that big square wave spike that I showed you on the scope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is turning the presence up now to 12 o'clock and you're looking at uh, probably a, about a 15 D boost, dB boost <laughs> at, at the range of between 20 and 50 kilohertz, way out there. Your ears and your speakers are gonna be rolling this off. Yeah. And what you're gonna, what you're gonna be left with is what happens between here and here, between 5K and say 15K. This is, where your ears are gonna start giving up. And this, <laughs> this would just normally go down like this, but in the in the analytical world, we're watching how the output transformer is really behaving okay. with regard to the feedback loop. And then we turn the presence all the way up, which is uh, reducing the, uh, negative, the negative uh, feedback loop high frequency response to the point where it's not attenuating the top end anymore. And we've got a, uh, probably what, is that 10? Almost 20 dB. Almost 20 dB yeah. boost. Again, Dang. above, above 10 kilohertz. So this is a staggering amount of top end frequency response, but your ears don't really hear it. And your speaker doesn't really reproduce it, but it makes its presence known. Do dogs love it? Dogs go berserk over this. But what's really happening that you don't hear and your speakers don't necessarily allow you to hear you know is hear it? there's still this sensitivity to the guitar behavior and could cause the guitar signal to start, uh, uh, you know, start feeding back with the amp. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why like Anna Marshall, that sort of natural feedback happens sort of in the up mids to upper mids, where in a high watt, you just sort of hear this really broad brush stroke of feedback and it isn't very specific. It's because a lot of it is happening up into the hearing range where you don't hear it. Right. And Unless you're left is the product of it down, yeah, down here. And uh, again, this doesn't really have much effect on the low frequency response. It doesn't even move. So we're still rolling off between 20 hertz down there, between 20 hertz and 10 hertz, actually 10 hertz. It just drops off like a stone down there. It doesn't have this gradual roll off no. that you usually see in a guitar amp. It just goes right off the cliff, which is really unusual behavior for a guitar amp. And that's really a big reason why high watts play the way they do. So having done that, now we're gonna go and see how much of that frequency response characteristic is influenced by this uh, um, frequency compensation network that happens right after the tone controls. I'm just going to do a quick voltage test to make sure that we're not going to spike the, uh, the input of our analyzer and we're nice and safe. Okay, so I'm going to go 
to this stage now. And we're gonna bring it up. And we've got significantly less gain there. Okay. So we're gonna compensate for that over here. You just, uh, you're, you're turning up the level in the interface? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. gonna set the presence back down. Right. Well, I can give you more level. That's what you like. Nope. Mass volume doesn't do anything. No. That's right. We're past all of that. Okay. So, so now the presence operates in two parts, in two separate parts of the circuit. One, one in one part, it's at the stage that we tested previously, which we've now bypassed. So the presence doesn't do any roll off like it did before. Yeah, the only thing it. the presence affects now is the is the feedback going into the phase inverter, which is this. And that isn't as radical a bump as it was before. It still brings that that frequency range way up there above 10 kilohertz, still does that, but it's not as radical and it's not as controllable. You can see why. David Reeves made the presence control attenuate below the 12 o'clock position at a different part of the circuit because it, otherwise it would not get rid of this big rise. Yes. <clears throat> so the other interesting thing about this is you see here, we get roll off at 100 hertz as opposed to way down here at between 10 and 20. Right. So that frequency compensation network before the phase inverse stage is really having a lot of influence on the behavior of the amp and the behavior of the low frequency roll off point. Um, so we want to get a snapshot of this. I'm going to set this at 12 o'clock. And so we're going to take a picture of this and store that. And then we're going to, I'm going to turn the presence up and we're going to take a picture of that and store it. I'm going to move back to the previous test point and we're going to take those two shots again and then we're going to switch amps. Okay. All right. So let's get that snapshot. All right. Okay. So now we're going to bring Dave's amp out and we're going to do the same test that we were doing here. We already know his amp sounds good. Mm -hmm. We already know what the preamp sounds like. Uh, we're just... We want to see what it looks like. Now. We want to see what it looks like and that's our reference point. So when we try this other modification of the frequency compensation network, how much it changes or influences the behavior of this one how close we get to the other one okay great all right all right so we got dave's amp on the bench right which means if anything goes wrong it's dave's fault right okay okay my operating theory at the time was that that frequency compensation network on the earlier amp is responsible for the extra brightness and tubbiness of the sound of that amp relative to this one. Makes sense. Okay, so what we did was we we did an anal we analyzed Be the ho ho hold on, sorry. Because that's really the, the main difference yeah. circuit wise between, between the two models. Okay, all right. right, yeah. So we analyzed that compensation circuit's performance and took a snapshot of it. Uh-huh. And I postulated that that was causing some exaggerated brightness and, and depth. So now we hooked up Day's amp the same way with this, feeding the same signal into it and into the analyzer and overlaid it on the old one. So the, the one that we tested, the one that we're working on right now previously is the, the gold line, right? The long one, basically. So yeah. That one, yeah. Right? And the green line represents day's amp. And as I predicted, the low frequency rolls off faster in day's amp, the green line there. Okay, now, um, just for those playing along at home who haven't watched the other videos, Dave's amp is an amplifier that you modded to mid 70s DR103 specs. That's correct. And which is your favorite That's high watt circuit. That's correct. Okay. All right. And I have the presence control on 12 o'clock like we did on the other test. Okay. So, and then you can see way out on the high frequencies, it's a lot less aggressive on the top end, right. past 10 kilohertz, right. which is pretty much what I expected. Now, when we turn the presence all the way down, 
it rolls off actually even a little more than the previous one we didn't we didn't take a snapshot of that because it isn't really that important but we did take a snapshot of the presence turned all the way up so now let's look at this at day's amp with the previous amp superimposed on that and there you see the high frequency I emphasis shift. with the presence turned all the way up on the other amp is extended out farther and hotter, which but would it make also, it brighter oh, and scratchier sounding. Yeah, because it's also shifted over more. So, it's shifted. Um, but the interesting thing to me is that is what's happening on the low end. Right. Um, Days is rolling off faster. Yeah. And that's not the output transformer because they're the same output transformer. That's this frequency compensation network there. So we're gonna verify that by going and sampling the signal at another point in the circuit past that frequency compensation network and okay. see what the result of that is because we're gonna overlay them on the other amp as well. So this will be instructive. So we're inserting the signal where now? Directly into the phase, phase inverter. inverter. Okay. And uh, okay, so this is the previous amp. There's the previous amp. And <laughs> whoa. Okay, I think somebody's correct. Somebody. Here. Whoa. This we're now looking at. <laughs> Just the phase inverter input of day's amps, which yeah. is virtually identical. Without the resistive whatever network. Right. It's identical. If I turn the presence up, uh, do we have a snapshot of this yep. input with the presence up? We do. That's the one. That's really minor. It's minor, but the... Uh, and, of course, most of the behavior is up... above the 10 kilohertz mark. Yeah. But there's an interesting little difference in the rise right here. The, the other amp, this is Dave's amp. Yeah. At 1K, it's a little bit more present in the mids. And that could be attributable to, it could be the, even the behavior of the phase inverter tube itself could cause a, that little bit of a sweep. But beyond that... I mean, is it so minor looking at that? that it, like, if we had three 1970-whatever this was, um, amplifiers, like, they could all be slightly different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, this, could be, this could be pot taper. It could yeah, be pot tolerance, right. even. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So when we turn the presence down to zero so it's not affecting anything and go back to... Uh, Go back to the other amps zero present snapshot where they it's identical they're virtually identical yeah so now we go and do that little modification and listen in to the, the resistive amp again. yeah what are you calling it it's Resist a frequency compensation network a frequency it's a fancy compensation way of saying network. a voltage divider with a bypass gap across it okay but we definitely pin down that yeah that's where the main that's where it happening. is yeah right. okay and uh, we'll come back. All right, all right. This is going to be deceptively, stupidly simple. The uh, this frequency compensation network is comprised of a two resistors and a capacitor. The resistor values are the critical component. Okay. And the one I like, the resistor that's compensated with the capacitor is one meg. And its voltage divider leg is 680K. On this one, the resistor that's bypassed is 1.8 meg, and the voltage divider leg is 1 meg. So we're taking the 1.8 meg out. And the 1 meg that was the bottom half of the leg is now going to be the bypass resistor in the top half of the leg of the voltage divider. 
and a new 680K resistor is gonna go in place of the original one meg value. That's what's really the beauty of this mod is it's so uninvasive and can be returned back to its stock value extremely easily to the point where you could barely even tell it was done. But this, you're not gonna wanna. But, but my guess is, and I, my guess has been pretty in pretty on point so far, but my guess is that you're not gonna wanna go back from this. Especially if I don't get it soldered correctly. Oh yeah, let's definitely botch the soldering. Sure, because why not? That's rock and roll, right? Really rock and roll. Okay, so we don't need to check the phase inverter input because we already know that that's the same. So all we're doing now is feeding the signal in at Frequency compensation at the network. Frequency compensation network, or FCM. the triode just before it. Okay. Right after the massive volume, right here. And we're ready to rock that. I believe I'm going to turn the massive volume down to zero and gradually <laughs> bring it up to noon. Now we're going to bring this amp up after the mod. It's same, same. Wow. So that means the, the tubby, farty bottom end is now in perfect shape as if it's been running on the treadmill for right. seven months. And let's talk about what happened here. What happened here? This resistor value was 1.8 meg. Okay. And this was one meg. And we changed this... 1.8 meg to 1 meg and this 1 meg to 680k. That was it. So the total resistance is almost half of this voltage divider. That doesn't really affect much the low frequency response, but we are getting a low frequency behavior change by having done that. It's very subtle, but that could be because those resistors in series are adding a little bit of an additional load on that tube that could affect the low frequency behavior but the biggest part of the behavior is that the high frequency emphasis is reduced practically by half because of this resistor value change okay and that's showing up exactly on there so now let's listen all right let's fire it up okay we've done the mod We've analyzed the results. We're playing through the Sound City 412 of Doom. At 60 ohms. I've got the power station bypassed right now just so we can hear the... Okay, but you, you switched it in the back? Uh, yes, or... it's set to 16, I believe. Okay. We've been on 16 pretty much the whole time. Well, you switched... I just I only did it just for the, when we were checking okay. the power. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. Moment of truth, folks. <laughs> Wow. Really? to the power amp section and see what happens. It's definitely got that broader, more open mid-range. Yeah, but we also didn't change the tubes yet. We didn't change the tubes yet, so it's uh, there's still some tubbiness, but that real egregious and scratch has gone away, which is, really was the main thing. <laughs> Oh.
Wow, it's got this nice harmonic feedback thing going now. Mm -hmm. and some range now. So I think that uh, that frequency compensation modification is really significant to the performance of the amp. And the icing on the cake is going to be putting some nice tubes in it. I think the 6CA7s, that's the classic 6CA7 thing which, where they just sound like brighter 6L6s. Okay. That was the thing about 6CA7s when they were being used predominantly in the late 70s as replacements because the EL34s were hard to get and didn't last very long. Yeah. And for the amps that used EL34s rather than 6L6s, that was just kind of the, that was the fix. Sure. A big reason of why Eddie used 68.7s is because they were more reliable on the road. Yeah. You couldn't get that many EL34s that were reliable at that time period. Yeah. They blew all the time. Okay. That's why Marshall switched to the 6550s right. to get around that problem. Right. So uh, the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to put some tubes in. and when, I'm not going to demonstrate that. I'm just going to take it on faith that we've taken it this far dramatically and putting in a set of tubes that is more musical in behavior is going to take it the rest of the way. And then we might mess around with the preamp tubes to see if we can just get it even a little juicier. And uh, given what tubes are in there, those, uh, um, these, uh, uh, these Amperex, these are really nice sounding tubes, but they do have sort of a, the hi-fi guys like them because they're so, they're so uh, linear sounding. Okay. And uh, a newer tube that's got a little bit richer uh, mid-range emphasis will go a long way towards the, putting the icing on the cake on I, this thing. I don't know if it's uh, making its way to the video, but just listening to it and even watching you play here in the room, um, it seems like the power tubes are pretty tired. Well, Does it feel that way when you're playing? I, I don't think, some. no. They, huh. When I put them under the scope, they're running right up at 112 no watts. Huh. We, I mean, we tested it after we changed the capacitor, and it was like bang right up there where it belongs. That is really how much the behavior of the 60A7s can affect the performance of the amp because they're, okay. not, they're not pentos like EL34s are. They're a different type of tube. They behave differently. All right. They behave like 6L6s. They're basically as... A uh, 6L6 in EL34's clothing, hmm. so they are cleaner, brighter, uh, and more robust on the low end. They behave more like a 6L6. That's why they're considered like an American EL34, yeah. meaning the American sound, which is the Fender sound, cleaner top, more robust bottom. That's normal for those tubes, uh, and uh, because they don't break up as easily you hear more of the nasties coming through the amp. Oh, okay, because that's what I'm hearing. EL34s have I'm this much on the more low end. gradual transition into overdrive. Okay, yeah. If you want, we can throw in a set. So we, we don't have to worry about adjusting the bias. We've got a good set of EL34s. We can just throw them in there. Let's do it. All right, we're going to do it. Let's do it. All right, EL34s. Okay, this is very likely going to be re really revealing about the difference in behavior between 90s, 80s, 90s era 6CA7s and the EL34s that are in there now, which are uh, early 90s era RFT East German produced EL34s. Mm -hmm. And since these are the ones that came at it 
the amp that I did for Dave, there's no question that... that We've heard them sound incredible. Right. So I think... You ready? Yep. I guess we're done here. Say goodbye, Steve. Goodbye, Steve. It.